Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming back to the third session of the China's panel. We have um, four papers going to be presented today. Three of them are actually um, going to be presented on Zoom. So um, yes, very glad that we have them joining us from overseas in different places. So the third panel, the theme of today is theorizing alternatives to US world domination. Um, we are having four papers, as I said. So the first paper is going to be presented by Gabriel Quintanina. His paper's title is China and the Neo-Capitalist Way of Development as an Alternative to the Pax Americana. Second paper going to be presented by Dick Lowe. His paper is Restating the People's Sovereignty China anti imperialism and the political economy of historical justice. That paper is going to be presented by Wang Hong. Um, we also have the translator today, um, Chong, going to translate for Wang Hong. The paper's title is China's Assimilation of Marxism and its Critique of Neoliberalism. The last paper will be by Javier Fidel, who is here today. And Samuel Spellman is the co-author. He is joining us on Zoom. Their paper is Towards a Theory of Chinese Embedded Globalization. So without further delay, I will hand over to Gabriel. So Gabriel, thank you. Please, um, yes, unmute yourself and um, yeah, share your screen if you can, please. Good evening, I'm going to share your screen. Yes. Perfect. Um, yeah, but this is, is it the first? Yeah. Yeah, this is the first question. Uh, can you see me? I don't think I've got the camera here. Um, struggling yeah, with. I can see you perfectly. And uh, it is um, large enough for us to see the screen, your screen as well. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm good. <coughs> My presentation is going to be about the China and the non-capitalist way of development as an alternative to the Pax American. Yeah. <clears throat> in his last writing, the Strait the Facultate, in the section about the relationship between law and philosophy, Immanuel Kant raised the question: What is an absolute monarch? He is one of those. He is one at whose command, if he says war is necessary, a state of war immediately is issued. Not fooled by the liberal form of the British parliamentary monarchy, the philosopher from Konigsberg denounced the belligerent policies of George III after the victory in the Seven Years' War. Just like the empire on which the sun never sets, in the wake of its territorial expansion and after the end of the Cold War, the United States has become a planetary tyrant. Its military interventions have usually been covered with the veil of noble motivations, where the expansion of democracy, the removal of tyrants from power, or retaliation against rogue states. Over the last 30 years, the United States carried out 24 military interventions around the world and carried out 100,000 aerial bombings. And in 2016 alone, during the administration of Barack Obama, they dropped 26,171 bombs on seven countries simultaneously. Contrary to the assumption theorized by academics such as Charles Kinnelberger and Robert Gilpin, the rise of hegemonic power after the Cold War period did not lead to stability and a state of perpetual peace, but to a state of perpetual warfare. The main reason for the rise of this unipolar moment of Pax American was the dissolution of the USSR and the end of people's democracies, which together made up the socialist bloc. In the wake of this political breakdown came the dismantling of the socialist state through mass privatization, the submission of these counters to the imperative 
imperatives of the shock doctrine on the left and this left and in this led the flank open for the penetration of finance capital in what might be called an attempt to economic recolonization the post-soviet space this event marked a turning point in global geopolitics as the presence of a socialist camp constitu constituted together with the working class movements and the creation of international forums that brought together the third world countries providing a contrary to the hegemonic domination and imperatives of the global north bourgeoisies, thus allowing a relative progression of human rights and living conditions. Although permeated by acute systemic contradictions, viewing the Cold War period as a bipolar clash not only obscures the power symmetry between the two poles, as the USSR pays a high cost in lives after the end of the World War II, around 20 or 30 million people were dead and a high material cost. So out of the Soviet Union was able to resist US hegemony in the military field, in the economic field, the USSR was in a disadvantaged position, but still it obscures the US economic competition with Japan and Germany. The two contradictions inside the socialist camp and the rise of the third world with Jewish national projects having as the reason the threat, the, re the maintenance of national sovereignty and economic development, often adopting characteristics from both sides of the Cold War. The end of the Cold War put an end to the United States security doctrine. During the George Bush administration, a turnaround in US foreign policy brought the concept of civilization clash at the center of the US policy making. Police preventing the emergence of regional powers and causing, their causing the destabilization were adopted. The US uses all means at its disposal to destabilize the powers that it sees as rivals or that do not fit its political economic model. The wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, in addition to interventions in Libya and Syria, created a zone of perennial chaos in the Middle East. In addition, a series of economic sanctions were applied, aimed at putting pressure on these regimes. So this explains what happens in Iraq, Afghanistan, and the Arab Spring, and the coups attempts, coups attempts and regime change in the Caribbean Sea region. The US work as the great manager of these regions of chaos, chaos called non-integrating gap, where other countries depend on them to exploit the raw material of these countries. The Brazilian economist Inácio Rangel, paraphrasing Clausewitz, said, politics as we know is the economy, economy made by other means, as far as the politics is made by special means, special means. Throughout the 20th century, we saw the refinement of non-military tactics for the exercise and projection of political power in the international sphere. With the ending of convertibility of the, gold, the dollar into gold, it is at this moment that the US begins to shift its labor intensive and low complexity industries to the counters of, on the periphery of the capital. This re the regulates its financial markets, detaching the sphere of commodity production from the sphere of capitalist, capitalist reproduction. And they begin to attract investments from all over the planet. At the same time, transnational institutions such as the, such as the IMF and the World Bank, which have been operating and outstretched the army of the young software power since the Marshall Plan, are beginning to impose a neoliberal paradigm. The dollar became a weapon of war. In the 1980s, the US was able to stop Japan's acceleration through Andaka and with the Plaza Agreement caused serious damage to the economy of Germany and again of Japan. The expansion of the socialization of the war created a decentralization production of the production relations. Those leading to expanded technical and technological interdependence. This interdependence came to be used as a weapon in the relation in the relation to the former colonial cultures. Francis Fernandez said, when a colonialist, colonialist country embarrassed by a colonial demand of independence proclaims the, with the nationalist leaders in mind, if you want independence, take it and return to the dark ages. 
the newly independent people in order to approve and take up challenge. And what we actually see is the colonizer withdrawing his capital and his technicians and encircling the, encircling the young nation with an approach of economic pressure. The other phase of quest Question of economic power are the sanctions. In a 1999 foreign affairs, John and Carl Miller state the following. During the Cold War, the effect of economic sanctions was generally limited because when one side is imposed from the other side, often undermined them. Thus, the US economic embargo on Cuba was substantially mitigated for a decade by compensatory Soviet aid. aid. But in the wake of Cold War, Sanctions are more likely to be comprehensive and thus effective in causing no harm, if not necessarily in achieving political objectives. So long as they can coordinate their efforts, the big countries have at their disposal a credible, inexpensive, and potent weapon for use against small and medium sized foes. The dominant powers have shown that they can inflict a normal spend at remarkably little cost to themselves or the global economy. Indeed, in a matter of months or years, whole economies can be devastated, as happened in 1991 and Serbia in 1992. Post 2006, financial sanctions got beyond asset freeze. For a series of mechanisms, they try to completely prevent the country's access to the international banking system and thus make it even more difficult for its ability to pay for imports and receives for exports. Countries like Iran, DPRK, were totally cut off from the SWIFT payment system. Thus, not only does hegemonic power break with the logic of imperialism, imperialism where capital exports were central of the part of the process of reproduction of capitalism, but denying the access of the so-called drug states to capital flows and to the international market becomes a weapon of war. This hegemonic situation is not only shaken by the economic crisis of 2008, but a series of military disadventures erodes the consensus, leading to the relative decline of the United States and the West. The non-capitalist way of development reduces. Marx periodized the areas of human development into modes of production, putting emphasis on the development of productive forces and the class struggle as the engines of historical development. Eric Hobsbawm drew attention to the risks of French force and reality in constant transition in a fixed form in rigid categories. In this way, to avoid having a static, a static pictures of a dynamic process, we must observe the modes of production as a large frame, both geographical and temporal, where constant dynamics transformation occur within it. Therefore, the analysis of specific historical process must be studied in the particularities. Marx, when analyzing the impact of the capitalist mode of production on Russian communes in his, correspond in his correspondence with Beza Zulich, compared the formation of the society to the formation of the globe, with a series of different layers of various ages, one superimposed to the other, marking the progression of epochs. The concrete reality tends to be clouded when viewed throughout the broad lens of the modes of production. So the proper tool to perform this type of analysis is the, ca the category of socioeconomic formations. As Elia Jabor put, the the concept of modes of production is the, is the universal socioeconomic formation is the particular. When we turn the lens to the national liberation movements and the resurgence of anti-colonial struggles, we are faced with the specific socioeconomic formations which defy a linear view of history. When faced with these complex realities, the scholars of the socialist bloc came up with the concept of the non-capitalist way of development, which defined it as the non-capitalist way of development is an aggregate of different and specific transitional stages, forms and methods that make it possible to gradually to channel the developments of national, nations living under conditions characterized by the prevailing pre-capitalist relations or relations where 
leading to capitalism along the socialist road be passing altogether or cutting short the capitalist phase, this process can lead to success only if there is a close alliance between the peoples of the lagging countries and the advanced proletariat of the developed socialist countries with the later vigorous our all support and the intense purposeful efforts of the country in question aimed at radical transformation of the old outmoded system. This was written by Ratoslavsky in 1978. The theory of the non-capitalism path was based on revolution, revolutionary potentials of the alliance between petty bourgeoisies, the peasantry, proletarian, simpletarian class, and the progressive sectors of the emerging national bourgeoisies. And they were attempting in countries like Tanzania, Algeria, Congo, Brazzaville, Guinea, Somalia, and Mozambique. Considering the national democracies as a state of transition of socialism, this kind of transition was called the non-capitalist path because, among other things, the advanced revolutionary force can ensure that there is no necessity either for a prior establishment of indigenous capitalism before a, so a socialist society can be constructed, or that capitalism will be the inevitable outcome of the developments within international democracy. Looking from the 21st century, the concept of non-capitalist development may seem dated and pointless. However, the change of historical advance of capitalism brings a new dimension to the concept of development and class struggle. Karl Marx analyzed capitalism now when innovation and development of the productive force arose from the shop floor, Nowadays, that science begins to take the lead in the process of technical and technological innovation, removing it from political necessity of the proletariat. The class struggle against a new complex where blocks of powers must be formed to dispute on the hegemony of society around the new political economic project. which involves not only the national dimension, but also the international one. Although it's hard to pinpoint to a real occurrence of these projects nowadays, aiming, aiming to overcome capitalism from a non-capitalist path, it's possible to point to socializing projects with broad popular mobilization, such as in the Venezuela, Nicaragua, and Bolivia. While it's difficult to predict whether these embryonic forms will give rise to a new type of socioeconomic formation. The globalization instituted by China. Since the beginning of the reform and opening up, when China had discovered its mercantile roots, a vertiginous growth process took place, which after four decades takes China to the center of hegemonic dispute with the United States, unlike the hegemonic dispute between USSR and the USA, which took the form of arms race, this new dispute takes on a mercantile controls. Between 1978 and 2019, its average real GDP growth rate was 9.1 per capita in common for a similar growth rate, 9.9% from $2,008.981 to 8,827 8, 8, in 2018. Between 1982 and 2011, the investment against GDP ratio was 36.9%. And since 2004, this rate operates above 4%. Since 2013, it has been the country with the highest volume of foreign trade in the world, generating widespread effects on the supply and demand of all countries in the world. Having in mind this new centrality of China in the geopolitical scene and the relative decline of the United States and the West, Javier Vadel and Elia Jabot, in an article from 2022 called From New Projectment Economy to Chinese Embedded, Embedded Globalization, they coined the term globalization instituted by China which must be understood as concentric cycles that reinforce each other simultaneously. The first is the promotion of existence and incorporation to existing multilateral institutions, United Nations system, IMF, World Bank, it's, uh, with demands for a more prominent role for develop, developing and emerging countries with a strong defense form of multilateralism. 
The second concentric circle is based on the promotion of minilateral relations in two ways, making agreements between People Republic of China with specific regions via police for, of forums with developing countries, and secondly, trade agreements and investment that China has signed with different regions of the world. The regional comprehensive partnership and the comprehensive investment agreement with the European Union. The core of this concentric circle is the classic, the classic bilateral relations with comprehensive agreements, the construction of a community of shared future of humanity. This is consolidated through the Belt and Road Initiative, BRICS, Shanghai Cooperation Organization as an infrastructure investment bank and the other international cooperation, providing Chinese solutions for human development. China stands as an economic pole capable of retaking the centrality of foreign trade making it possible to spread the most advanced forms of present mode of production through the spurt of large public goods, through the potential, potentializing of South-South trade, Tony, as exposed by Elia Jabot, the transformation of foreign trade into a state and public good. The decline of the US hegemony opens space for res a resolution of force between the Council of the Global South, which is essential for overcoming a model of international uh, inter international law, international relations based on a, on a symmetry of power. New project economy offers a model of state governance not to be followed as each country has its own historical paths and peculiarities, but a model to learn from, be it for the cap capability of promote modernization for rural societies, as for an economic model governed by the reason in the face of systemic kills caused by imperialism. This includes avoiding some mistakes that happen during a complex process of monolith scale in China. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. Right. Okay. We will have Tech Lo as the second speaker. Okay. Uh, let me share the screen with you. Okay. Hope that you. You can see it clearly. Thank you. Okay. Right. Uh, so it's good to see, <laughs> to have this opportunity to give a presentation on these topics. Now, it is unprecedented for me as an academic, as a student of the dismal science that is economics, to give a presentation on a topic that is essentially political. I'm sorry, Dick. Um, we got a comment that um, we cannot hear you very well. Are you able to get closer to your mind? Because the speaker that we have is just um, a small one here. Okay, is it clear now? Yeah, it's, it is. Yeah. Maybe for the screen, can you make it a bit bigger as well? It's better, you promise. Uh, let me. Yeah. Maybe it's sixty-three percent at the moment. Maybe coming to eighty-five. Is it okay to make it better? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It's okay now. Right. Great. Thank you. Okay. So let me say again that uh, it is unprecedented for me as an academic and a student of the dismal science that is economics to give a presentation of a topic that is essentially political. And the message I want to convey to you is, that is also quite very much an unwelcome in the environments that surround, that surrounds me. Uh, uh, that is to say, it's, uh, it's uh, quite uh, in contrast to the perceived wisdom of many, even on the political left. Importance because my the focus of my talk is on, on my presentation is on Hong Kong and Taiwan, which room large in the international discourses over the question of the progressiveness or otherwise of the Chinese political economy. And the question I say is political because it concerns the sovereignty of what I call the Chinese people versus varieties of local self-determination. Fundamentally, the people as a historical category needs justification. And my justification is on the basis of political econ economy analysis. Now this presentation is 
the meant to provide some pointers for answering the question. And it takes as its starting point the proposition that in the modern world, the historical justice of the category, the people, is most crucially determined by anti imperialism. Now, and this is, I consider the, the defining characteristics of imperialism that is, it entails capital exploiting labor on the world scale and by extension, therefore, northern capitals exploiting and suppressing southern labor. So anti-imperialism at the level of determining the people signifies endeavors of resisting systematically, systematically the hegemonic world order of capitalism. And the formation of the Chinese people and its evolution to date can be justifiably considered as such an endeavor any advocacy of an actual conduct of pushing for local self-determination for Hong Kong and Taiwan needs to be assessed in terms of their historical justice vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese people. And uh, the message of the conclusion I want to uh, arrive at is that uh, what I call the democratic reunions is possibly the most justifiable as the future prospects for the two regions. Now, we need to go to the historical context, which uh, I call it the transition from Pax Britannica to Pax Americana, that is the world order of capitalism associated with the predominance of Britain or the British Empire in the first half of the 20th century and then the next one thereafter from uh, the predominance of the United States. Now, uh, let me take this as the starting point. The recent fanfare of publicity in Western media over the status of Hong Kong pre-1997 pushes to the forefront the need of strengthening what is meant by colonialism, imperialism, and their resistance. And of course, the China-US confrontation over Taiwan further heightens the stake, not least for the global polit political or intellectual left of this need. China has, has always insisted pre-1997 Hong Kong was an occupied region, not a colony. That is to say, it denounces the legality of the treaties that ceded Hong Kong to Britain which the British establishments have insisted legal, but have failed to uphold. And in, in fact, early on in the 1970s, once China got its seats in the UN, it was able to mobilize a vast majorities of countries in the world in the contest with the Western bloc to result in China successfully getting the UN to take out Hong Kong from the list of colonies and the reason behind this or the justification for China's position is that the legality of outright colonialism, imperialism, which was essential to the world order of Pax Britannica is now void. And this is the outcome of revolution overflowing the legal arrangements. And it is enshrined in the UN charter, which denounces outright colonialism, imperialism. What about Taiwan? The same principle applies. It was deemed an occupied region pre-1945 because the treaty which, with which China ceded Taiwan to Japan was essentially part of the world order, which can be labeled as well, perhaps Britannica. <clears throat> now this position was confirmed in the uh, Potsdam Declaration and the Cairo Declaration preceding it. And this was a promise made by the allies to the Chinese people that were at that time devoting their maximum efforts, sacrifices to sustain the war against the access. I'm talking about in the year 1944 and 45. So actually similar, similar promises 
in the form of the UN Charter were made to the rest of the non-Western world. Of course, in the event, the US reneged on the promise in 1950 following the Chinese Revolution, and hence we saw the US seven fleets blocking the Taiwan Strait, the exclusion of China in the formulation and signing of the Treaty of San Francisco, the US-Taiwan military alliance, etc. Taiwan politics in this context evolved progressively from anti-communism to anti-communism plus anti-China. And the, the pro-unification left wing that dominated Taiwan society in the late 1940s and early 1950s was bloodily wiped out. Not, notwithstanding, past Americana is not the kind of outright colonialism, imperialism that has been cast aside by the world. So unlike past Britannica. So its dominance and resistance are still ongoing to date. And hence, in addition to revolution and overflowing legal arrangements, legality is still a real issue. That's why China has also been stressing the legality of the Potsdam Declaration and denouncing the Treaty of San Francisco on legal grounds. Now, perhaps even more complex is that, the, and with even more powerful political ramifications, of Presbyterian Americana concerns the contested interpretation of the principles of the UN Charter. Ultimately, what the issue concerns was meant by democracy and therefore self-determination. Democracy in its true meaning means the supreme authority resting with the people. So the premise for democracy is the people well-defined and formed on the basis of sufficient historical justice. The existing Hong Kong people and Taiwan people, in so far as they stand in contrast to the Chinese people, these were formed historically on the basis of being delineated by the military forces of past Britannica and past Americana respectively. And the Taiwan people, even to date, is still defined by a US internal legislation, the Taiwan Relation Act. So the supreme authority rests with a foreign master, not the local residents, any justice. Self-determination is an act of exclusion, and this is the fundamental point, but because in the case of Hong Kong and Taiwan, inevitably, it entails local residents attempting to deprive the right of the rest or majority of the Chinese people over the sovereignty. So any justice for this, we do therefore need to reconsider the historical justice of the Chinese people. The formation of the Chinese people is through the revolution of the 20th century against world capitalism. This historical category, judged by the principle of the UN Charter, is far more justified than the world orders of capitalism before and after the war. This historical process involves the sacrifices by tens of millions, and its levels of justice is therefore much higher than the willingness or the identification of the the, the, the fashionable uh, identity politics that, that uh, has become pervasive that in the world, that including that in the case of here, Hong Kong, Taiwan, among the left as well. But, but, but I argue that the level of justice of the Chinese people is much higher than the, the, the willingness or identification of the existing people in Hong Kong, Taiwan. Now, of course, there could be two possible objections. Actually, these have been raised by the, all the different kinds of self-labeled left-wing self activists or intellectuals regarding the statement which I have just made above. First, to date, is the Chinese people still sufficiently justified 
relative to the universal values embodied in the UN Charter and of the actual practices of Pan Americana. And second, is historical justice associated with the Chinese people necessarily the all powerful, most important, so much so as to disregard the specificity of Hong Kong, Taiwan, his history and society. Now I won't be able to go into the, the details because of time constraints, but what I want to mention is that this is the official uh, stand position of the China People's Republic from the time of its funding all the way up until now, that the, the people is central in terms of justifying the its position. And the people, uh, wants revolution in the sense of undoing the exploitation imposed by world capitalism. Now here two uh, uh, points, first history, second political economy. History, the Chinese re revolution has its origin back to the May 30th movement in Shanghai and simultaneously the great Guangzhou Hong Kong strike in uh, the 1920s. And this is the first time that the Chinese working class entered the political stage. It also signifies the Hong Kong community as part of the Chinese people. Now, the objective of the revolution was clear enough to bring down the social and power relations imposed by actually existing capitalism, that is imperialism. <clears throat> now, in, in our times, so the concerning political economy in the era of new liberal globalization. Exploitation manifests itself mainly in the form of the fin financial hegemony underpinned by uh, the term borrowed from David Harvey, accumulation by dispossession, that is plundering and um, financial plundering, financial uh, predation plus cheapening of labor on the world scale. The nature of the Chinese revolution is such that it has always aspired to establish a new framework of social and power relations that transcends historical capitalism in terms of justice, that is empowering the Chinese people to resist the exploitation of the systemic capital accumulation of historical capitalism. And of course, the revolution is still an unfinished project today. As such, the project is infused with all kinds of complexities and uh, two particularly important uh, uh, government and nationhood, which are immediately relevant to the question of Hong Kong and Taiwan. Now, government actually concerns the, the, the form of the democracy. Right? And over the past hundred years, the Chinese revolution has persistently followed a path of party-led nation building, that is to build up a framework of social and power relations that undo the oppression of historical capitalism. And such an endeavor necessarily requires the mobilization of the entire society, and which therefore requires a strong and rigorous leadership. Both the Communist Party and before that, the Nationalist Party, the KMT, but have historically adhered to these principles, only that the KMT has failed the test of revolution. And by the way, both of the two parties were uh, formed very much uh, the, the, the based on the, very much with the assistance of the communist internationals. That does exist in the, in the history justification of the principles Fundamental progresses have been made for the revolution, most importantly, the success in resisting the, the conquer of press Britannica, that is the Japanese uh, aggression, and the oppression by press Americana, that is the first two decades of the People's Republic. So we can have the inference just from the historical record that party-led nation building as a replacement for competitive political uh, parliamentary politics, which prevail in the first 15 years of the uh, uh, Republican era, uh, 
does have its justification in terms of fitting the interests of people. And therefore, that because the revolution is a unfinished project, therefore Chinese politics today have both attributes of progressiveness and backwardness relative to the actual practices or at least the principles of Pan American and the principles mainly in the form of bourgeois universal values, but mainly that in the UN chapter, chap, charter, liberty, etc., and also socialist universal values, liberalized liberation, etc. For justice to be materialized, that requires the collective actions to push forward the progressiveness and to overcome the backwardness within the space the available from the historical conditions. And for both Hong Kong and Taiwan, therefore, the democratic reunions that is embodying the unity of promoting democracy and reunions is possibly the only scenario that is consistent with these lines. And the same for the consideration of nationhood. This is question concerning the trade off between the existing unitary system and the possible alternative of a federal system or a reasonable, reasonable combination of elements of the two. The arrangement of the relationship, I think I have uh, three more minutes. Right? The arrangement of the relationship depends on the historical conditions, that is to say, the degrees of the completion of the revolution in time, life and life and death conjunctures, systemic mobilization of the entire society is necessary and the past should submit to the whole. So the, the revolution cannot afford to tolerate, tolerate any form of local chauvinism in when, when it the society as a whole is threatened by imperialism. And we can here infer from historical records that the unitary system as a replacement for the de facto federal system of the early Republican era, again, does have its justifications. Now, the, the bigger question is today, in views of the condition of the reality, is it possible to have an alternative arrangements both concerning government and nationhood, the, therefore for the purpose of promoting the, the, the what we can call the universal values of the, the socialist ideals. Now first, objective conditions is clear that, the, or is sufficiently confident to judge that the Chinese people's material strength today is sufficiently developed, and which is of course a great achievement from the, the struggles of the past hundred years. But so that it, today it is not vulnerable to external subversive forces. And the main subversive danger today is from domestic fronts. That is the possibility of certain domestic power blocks turning themselves into compliant or interest. Now, the, uh, given the, the objective conditions, the future prospects for the progress of the Chinese revolution, therefore rests on increasing the mass mobilization and, and participation in public affairs, that is democracy in its true meanings against that in this context for Taiwan and Hong Kong's democratic reunions is likely the uh, most uh, justifiable and at the same time realistic the, the scenario for their future prospects. Okay, I think given the time the constraint, I, I should stop at this point and uh, I will welcome your comments. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thanks. It is really an important subject and um, thank you so much for um, 
attempting doing this um, subject as your um, yeah, paper because it's needed to be debated and discussed and to be understood. So I think today we can have some discussion around this, um, the question that you raised. So, um, Interesting. My presentation. Yes. Samuel, is everything, is everything okay, Samuel? Hey there. Uh, yeah, we're seeing your presentation. Yeah. Okay. Are you seeing someone? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. All people are seeing. Okay. Okay. Let's begin. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, my presentation, the subject is about globalization. Yes. Trying to theorize uh, Chinese embedded globalization. We work with uh, Samuel. Thank you, Samuel, so much. We're talking about uh, recently the cafe with Alberto, Elias, about transitions. Uh, we, we can interpret all, all stages of history as a transitions, but maybe. Uh, now, as Marx emphasized, uh, simple quantitative changes arriving at a certain point result in the qualitative changes. I will focus on the qualitative changes in this work. I'm sorry because my voice is not good. I sleep bad. Yes, <laughs> I almost sleep one hour. Then, this presentation elaborates on the series of transformations proposed by China on the global system. It should be understood that China has historically presented itself as a promoter of multipolar global system, supported of five principles of Pacific co coexistence. And we propose an interpretation of the rise of China from a kind of synthesis between international political economy geopolitics, international relations too. Uh, trying to decipher an ongoing global process that we call Chinese embedded globalization, uh, an embryonic process. Mm -hmm. Or Chinese um, globalization, globalization with Chinese characteristics. This uh, should be understood as a structural component of the current geopolitical scenario centered around the China-US rivalry. Institutionally, this globalization should be understood through concentric circles that simultaneously reinforce each other. The nuclear concentric circle is related to bilateral relations, China with global south North and the second, uh, in a paper I will um, show to you at the final of my presentation, uh, the second concentric circle is about minilateral relations. Uh, specifically, the forum policy, the diplomacy forums, and or regional uh, trade agreements. Are CIP. And the external concentric circles is a promotion of cooperation in multilateral institutions, United Nations, or the new um, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Let's continue. Uh, this globalization is organically is related to the, uh, to the emergence of a new social formation within Chinese society. I'm very grateful for uh, Elias and Alberto work to the light to understand the projection of power of this um, no, Chinese power in this contemporary world. For this reason, reason, globalization is understood as a, a specific interconnectivity of different economic and social formations 
in determine, determined historical times. Neoliberal globalization reflects the US hegemony and its contradictions. The expansion of global finance, the monopoly dollar of the dollar in the global capitalist system, and reveals the Janus phase of raw geopolitics through an expansive NATO in a, po in a post Cold War. The um, Chinese globalization, embedded globalization, expressed a particular projection of Chinese economical, economic and political power. Uh, it is necessary to focus on the concept of globalization from the mainstream. I think we, re we read a lot of papers of main mainstream discussion, debates about globalization. Uh, this debate is very now symptomatic parochial debate. China is an alien. It's, it's an alien. And the debate is about Lexit, Brexit, here in Europe specifically. We are trying to decompose this Chinese embedded globalization with empirical work. I, I published some words about um, CELAC and China CELAC Forum, Latin America, with Samuel, a uh, recent paper about Asian investment infrastructure bank. And we understand this globalization as a totality, the negation of neoliberal globalization. Negation of negation in Hegelian methodology, philosophy, because neoliberal globalization, in some way, is a negation of embedded post-war globalization. Then we understand this globalization as a negation of a delegation. It's very symptomatic. You, we think that we can understand Xi Jinping discourse in 2017 in Davos as a defender of, of supporter of globalization in front of the tr Donald Trump discourse of uh, American first as a negation of the negation. The globalization uh, is not an anti-globalization narrative as we suppose with our Kantian uh, or Kantian uh, mind, no, it's a Hegelian mind. I think we can understand, like like other presenters, the Chinese thinking, because Chinese thinking is, is dialectical too, as Marx and Lenin and Hegel. Uh, this crisis of current phase of capitalist economic global utopia, as Samira Amin pointed out. Sabina Min's intuition in 1996 is very interesting because he states, stated that neoliberal globalization is thus once again merely the sign of a crisis of accum accumulation rather than its solution. The crisis of neoliberal globalization we could interpret or as a, as a solution of the mold of accum accumulation a restoration or as a crisis of accumulation and the exhaustion of financial financialization as a mode of crisis management. Our way is the second way. This is a, a kind of resume of post-1945 US-led embedded globalization, Bretton Woods system in a permanent conflict with two other worlds. Because this globalization was not global at all. We can the second world, okay? So the Soviet world and the third world, the global south, the Bandu with Bandu spirits. It's incomplete global globalization. It 
in the 70s and 80s it's very interesting because it's the hegemony of the US by, the, by neoliberal globalization. Hmm? The main, main tools, military and financial with the primacy of monetary, dollar Wall Street system. The debt crisis, the real, real debt trap. It, it was the debt crisis in Latin America and Africa at the end of the Cold War and the expansion and in intensification of capitalist relations in the world is the real globalization uh, in, in all world. What uh, the other phase? The other phase is in, in the narrative of the end of the national state, end of history, <laughs> the reality is the geopolitical aspect of neoliberal globalization expansion of NATO hmm, from a defense, a metamorphosis of a defense organization to a, an offensive organization. I think this narrative is not uh, political correct here in Europe now, but it's, in, it's our interpretation of facts. <laughs> the, um, I, I think this, uh, slide re resume this uh, post, this, this rule-based liberal world order and the rise in China in the middle. Uh, the globalization of 21st century. The Chinese embedded globalization begins with the process of rise in China and declining US hegemony. The next is China since 2012-13. I think it's a qualitative change inside China. You know better than me, than us, but uh, with a real consequence in the power projection of China uh, and um, the born or better road initiative as a milestone is a Russian projects to a world project. Uh, China as a great public good provider is very interesting because in the last document is it's very clear that not only vaccines, I work, we work in vaccines, uh, diplomacy and, and uh, a mask and vaccine diplomacy in Latin America with a group of uh, researchers. Uh, and I think the second part is some of Chinese uh, trying to, to show the, this China, uh, Chinese economic power. I will advance. Our the theoretical approach is very important. Four pillars. The first one, the first one is Marx Lenin, uh, is the importance of the concept of economic social formal, formations to understand the power projection of China as an international geopolitical, uh, geopolitical expression, as embryonic uh, uh, socialist, social, socialist social formation. Uh, and a new paradigm or regime of international relations in current geopolitics. International, transnational, and intercivilizational. The globalization as economic social formations in dispute, in reordering, reordering world signifies that we go uh, from the state to social formation as another complex concept, including uh, a big state. So, um, and maybe uh, as Gramsci, uh, the civilian, civil and political society uh, in uh, 
world politics. Globalization we see as an as a interaction, interaction of economic social formations in some in determined historical period with substantive changes in the space-time relationships. And the crisis in current capitalist social formations and the governance of imperialism, imperialism now as a challenge for the United States. Uh, the second, Carpolani, not only about embedded, term, uh, the concept of embedded, but because uh, we think that Carpolani is an, a dialectical, a dialect, dialectical thought because he understood capitalism as a, a movement, movement and counter movement. And we see this process uh, of rising China and the new globalization of a counter global movement. The world system theory, Samir Amin is very important, Arigi, and the dial dialectical approach, Hegel, Marx, but Professor Chin Yachin was very important for our work. And then this, uh, this is a, this, the, I will pass the word to Samuel because Samuel is not totally um, in synchrony with me about the geopolitical and superstructural and structural component of this totality. Samuel, if you want to. Okay, that, uh, let, let me get from, from here. Well, thank you so much, Javier, for, for, uh, for you know, the, the, the presentation up until now. So, uh, so, so the Chinese embedded globalization that we are presenting here have well two, two separate dimensions, right? When we talk about the dialectical process that is going on, there are the issues concerning the structure and the issues obviously concerning the superstructure, as you may already have been anticipating. So there are several consequences for the productive and commercial uh, economic consequences of the of the of this change in the globalization process, uh, because the this through planning uh, uh, through planning China directly affects globalization as a whole. So it affects the value form of the, of the, of uh, the global. It affects the value form within capitalism in order to change it. So through this process, as uh, as Elias and Gabriela exposed. Uh, you have this uh, utmost connection to the value form and to productive capital. Uh, it also changes commercial uh, commercial issues in the the, part, the whole world. So it it's ob it obviously affects it all. You also have a direct confrontation at the financial field, as we are experiencing. Just uh, just yesterday, we we've noticed that uh, China and Russia are heightening their commercial links through UN. So th there is also the, this, uh, this avenue to, to talk about, but also uh, the, there is a geopolitical side uh, up until this. As Javier said, there is a debate among us of the, the, the role of geo geopolitics in all of this, because is it, is, does it belongs in the structure? And if so, does the ge geopolitics as a whole affects the structure of the whole mode of production or does it belongs as a political form and so it relates to the superstructure. But beyond this debate, what we can see is that uh, China expresses a, a, for, a particular form of multipo multipolarism that is based on Guanxi, which has a, not only a focus on the uh, Eurasian region as a whole for, for strategic means, but also through direct connections. But we see that uh, through the, in the buildup to this multipolarism, China also uh, confront, confronts the established uh, uh, narrative and, and also the established um, alliance, which is NATO, which is also in response changing itself in order to become global. So it's a, 
uh, it is a dialectical approach between the two sides of it. At the superstructure, we have the multilateralism, which I will get into a bit later. And, and we also have a, a direct connection to the ideational forms, because we see that China proposes new, uh, new forms for thinking about humanity, as we've, we've seen actually in other presentations here today. So uh, there's also a, a, a direct connection between this ideational form of interpreting uh, international relations and the Westphalian world order, because China now proposes a different kind of understanding of communities, which is the, which is well, the community with shared future for mankind. And it, that it also uh, encompasses a rebirth of the Bandung spirit, which has been proposed for over 70 years now. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, and I forgot to say that this also happens in direct confrontation to the, to the restricted vision of the rules-based order, which is a, also a development from the, from the liberal order established after World War II. So uh, we have here two institutions that are uh, an answer to, to a nation from China to the multilateral structure of the international liberal order, which has been developing up to now, these are the AAB, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, and the Belt and Road Initiative. As Javier said, we're exploring these, these issues at particular uh, uh, papers, you know, in order to reconstruct the theory as a whole. Uh, you can uh, pass through the, another slide, please. Yes, and we, as we have said, there is also this organization or this structure that in our manner of exposing this, because there are levels of, uh, of institutionalism. There are levels of institutional engagement that China proposes. So we express this as three uh, concentric circles because this belongs, this logic of concentric circles belongs in the whole structure of thinking of the of Chinese, Wang, uh, Chinese Guangxing. So what we see here is that there is a core formed by, bile by bilateral diplomacy it is circumvented by a second level, which uh, to which many lateral and regional policy are focused on. So we have some levels of direct diplomacy here, but also an engagement to existing structures regionally, as such as RCEP. But also we have a third level, which is China's engagement to existing multilateral, multilateral institutions, but also China's engagement to new institutionals such as the AAB. Uh, uh, next one, please. Oh, uh, what? Uh, the one point. Uh, it's not bilateral or multilateral or minilateral. Uh, it's very interesting because to enter in a forum diplomacy for CAC or Belt and Road, you have to sign uh, bilaterally. And then you belong to mini or multilateral. At the same time, it's not A or B. It's A, B, and C in this case. Uh, well, okay, Samuel. Oh, yeah, yeah, very, very good. One. Uh, well, the, uh, I'm sorry. This, this is very interesting because we research empirically the experience in the two years of pandemic years, mask and, and uh, vac vaccine diplomacy in Latin America have two papers, one they will publish in Latin American perspective because it was rejected with another journal because we, we have to, have to uh, it's another, another history. But it's very interesting because uh, we detect flexibility, adaptability, multidimensionally, multi-actor, provincial cities, federations, twin towns, twin cities. Yes, yes. And no conditionalities, no interference, and so on. Right? And uh, next one, Samuel. Okay, um, oh, very, very good comment. So uh, finally, we return to the dialectics of the, of the Chinese embedded globalization. So what we have here is that, uh, well, 
the Chinese embedded globalization emerges as a as a response, but also as a part as uh, a part of the globalization order. What we're seeing up until now is a is a changing in the the whole function of capitalism, and so its negation uh, is already happening. And this this hap uh, it happens it should happen through the development of the of the periphery. This has been exposed by several thinkers of world system theory, but what we can gather here is that uh, ultimately there will be an answer for to all of this. This answer uh, it's. It exists as a form of uh, negation of the negation, as an off webin of the whole process. And if so, uh, well, yeah, yeah, we're at the final considerations now. And if so, uh, this uh, this final form is ex emerging through the Chinese embedded globalization. Uh, but this process also makes the the existing globalization change as well in order to respond to it. So the these. Uh, what emerges, this, the global scenario that emerges from this is a changing the whole fun function of the existing structure. So obviously the Americans will, re will react to this. In what forms? Well, there, there will be changes to the existing globalization, but it's taking a, an avenue that is restricting itself. So uh, our final considerations for today is are that uh, what the, what's the meaning of the CAG, right? Uh, is, is it a global projection or a new capitalist rivalry? Well, we negate that. We think that this, this is not a new capitalist rivalry, but uh, on the contrary, it's the global projection of a new social economic formation. And if so, uh, in this projection all, uh, outwards, uh, a new economic system ha has already been uh, admitted by some, uh, some liberal thinkers. Uh, but it, it should take different forms. It takes uh, the form of a new economic system in its embryonary form. So it's, a, it's the passage maybe from a primitive socialist accumulation to a higher form, but also this expresses itself uh, outwards as, a, as also a, a, po a possibility for, pro for developing countries to also uh, engage themselves to the world economy. And also, uh, this is a this may be a, a new form of socialist social formation, because this now exists not only within China but also affecting the whole world. So China has risen up to the level that it affects the whole functioning of uh, of the capitalism as a whole. So uh, to to finalize, you all, we were just saying that the Chinese embedded globalization is not a model. It's a flexible road. And if so, China will continue to adapt itself to the changing circumstances as we are seeing uh, uh, every day. Okay, so the, uh, and the, if so, it will continue to adapt to the changes to the global uh, globalization, exist, to the existing globalization. Well, um, our emails were right there. You know, if you, if you would like to, to uh, talk to us later, you can just talk to Javier. He will, amaze, he will give you our, our contacts and thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, thank you very much you. for a good presentation. Sorry to rush you guys um, because yes. we just want to save some time for um, discussion. Um, so the floor is open now, we can discuss. Um, maybe I will also just um, raise, um, give some comments, also some questions as well. Even though my question is specifically for Beg, but um, I think it's relevant to all the presenters, so feel free to address it as well. Um, I think Dick has really put out um, a very um, timely presentation on um, the, the Hong Kong and Taiwan, how they see themselves, the right of self-determination, and also why they are inc incompatible in the whole struggle in the Chinese people, I think um, Dick has explained it very well. Um, on the other hand, for fighting against imperialism, I think legality and also justice is not enough because you can see like from the first presentation from Gabriel, they are all unjust. But the, the effort to fight against it relies on the people who see themselves as part of this struggle. But in Hong Kong, when you listen to Wang Hong's presentations um, delivered by Chong, you can see that they see themselves as part of this 
struggle, this project, if we may say, anti-imperialist project. But unfortunately for people in Hong Kong and Taiwan, they are separated by colonialism. And then the people feel that they are not part of this whole struggle, even though they should be. So in order for them, apart from just looking from the legality point of view and also historical justice, what can be done to, to make these people who are totally against um, China's anti-imperialist struggle? How, how, do make, how do you make them feeling being part of it? And, and what are the processes that need to be done to make them, like Wang Hong said, people feel that the self-interest actually is interlinked with the society and as a whole uh, and represented by the state as well. So how, how can that be, um, be done in the, in the future? Maybe Gabriel also has some comments as well because you have listed a lot of other examples on um, the struggles against imperialism. So um, yeah, that's my question today. And um, anyone else? Yes, Thomas, please. Uh, I'm, I'm just curious about one thing, actually, the first presentation of Gabriel. Uh, there's a slide that you show uh, these this flags of the countries and the connections between trade. And uh, as far as I understand, there's a, there's a, a period from 1960 until 2020, Z. And I, I found very interesting uh, this relation, but I, I would like to understand if you, because I, I, I don't know if you're right, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, this, this connection on this proximity of these this countries and trade are the whole period and I would like to understand if you if you have uh, noted some change between periods, if, if you can identify this during periods or different periods, because if it's it's a copulate of, of the whole period, uh, you have like 60 years there. And I, I would like to understand if, if there's any change between those relations along the, this, this period. That's on that. Anyone else? Any questions from the audience? No, maybe. Um, then um, we will go to tech if you want to answer the first question. And any? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, just a quick response. Um, yes, I uh, definitely the legality and justice are not sufficient for the convincing of, and not mention mobilizing the the residents in Hong Kong and Taiwan. Uh, in in the direction of the anti-imperialism, that's the definitely true, and that is a reflection of the predominance of the ideology and, and behind the material forces of imperialism in these two regions. But nevertheless, legality and justice and uh, are important part of the project of anti-imperialism. After all, those supporters of the anti-China uh, movements, uh, uh, many of them actually, I could use the term, they're innocent, uh, but based on ignorance. Uh, so they believe they are doing a just and uh, glorious uh, uh, work in the anti-China movements and it is necessary uh, uh, to, to, uh, to present a critique of the uh, subversion of their uh, of their beliefs as part of the broader project of anti-imperialism but after all material forces uh, or ideology or values or discourses are part of the material forces but not the main, the most important part. So in the end, China need to be able to present uh, an alternative to the, the, to the, mem the residents of the two regions that uh, transcends the, was offered by the, the, by the existing the hegemony of imperialism, either in the form of the 
materials ar arrangements or as simply a matter of belief, but China need to be able to present a better alternative. And I think democratic reunion is the, is the necessary in uh, part of this better alternative. Although the, the substance of such an I, the idea need to be developed. But that's the maximum I can say, but yeah, yeah, I don't have any more. Okay, no problem. Thank you. It's very, very, very good already. Um, any other speakers? Yeah. Um, Thomas, ask the question to Gabriel. Well, I will address the first question by Sinki, and I think that it is a very long jury process and uh, you have uh, this problem here in Brazil too, and I think that in India the problem is big where they see China as a threat rather than a multilateral partner. Uh, well, we have a massive hegemony of the intellectual means and the, the media means, which are controlled by the imperialism and the hegemonic power of the world. And uh, Gramsci said that uh, there is a, a, a struggle for the hegemonic, and I think this is a protracted warfare with, with workers that they have to form their conscience of the possibilities of the China. There is also the state bureaucracy that is part of the struggle you see in the third world, uh, the old third world and the global south countries like uh, Myanmar and uh, Cambodia, that they they have this kind of struggle where they are divided between uh, more hegemonic uh, core of the world and uh, a better relation with China. I don't think that this will be an easy question, a easy, easy question or uh, a quick thing to do, but I think that in the long run we can have a better perspective. Well, uh, addressing to the question of, uh, I forgot his name. Thomas. Thomas, yeah. Uh, in the 1960s, you have uh, the United States in the core of the economic trade with uh, British as a little partner and uh, a core of the continental Europe with Germany and uh, an island with the USSR and some socialist countries. And I think that it's Finland together with, uh, well, Finland had a good relations with the United Soviet Union and they were big partners in the 1960s. In the 1990s, you have uh, a core with the continental Europe that uh, uh, contains countries of the old colonial, like uh, the African colonies and the French, col the ex colonies in Africa. And you have Japan leading the space of uh, uh, Southern or East Asia. And you have China with uh, countries like Mongolia. Myanmar and the North Korea, and the, but it's a very small island too. And in 2020, you have China at the center of uh, the, the uh, world trade with uh, United States as a little partner. And you have uh, the European space that means the European Union and some countries that uh, still were the old colonies and they think that there is a strange tendency of the United States of being a, a small partner in trade and I think that this is because of the financialization of the economy of day the, and the, there is a, the, Uni the European Union concentrates the trade in Germany, basically. Yeah, 
Okay, thank you. Just, uh,